episode 120, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative way through expert analysis. Today's expert is Dr. Sarah Lowe's. She's an economics professor at UC San Diego, and she wrote an interesting piece where she talks about how people lose trust in medicine and medical institutions if they've been subjected to a long colonial rule. Now, this pertains to Central Africa, where she's done a lot of work. We're talking about Cameroon, Congo, Uganda, and others. But basically, her premise is that if you've had a lot of colonial interventions in the past, usually in the early 1900s, that generations later, people are still very mistrustful or distrustful of medical campaigns. This would things like free blood tests for HIV or vaccination programs. So the question is, if you've had a lot of interactions with the colonial governments and interventions in the past, even many generations later, does that affect your trust of the medical system? Really interesting stuff and something entirely different that we've talked about in the past. We always focus on the U.S. medical system, so let's talk a little bit about foreign medical systems and general societal trust in things that are affected by colonial governments. It's also a shorter episode, so you should be able to consume it very easily today. But before we begin, here's a quick message from Physician Financial Services, a business widely recognized in the physician community for disability insurance. Lawrence B. Keller, CFP, has been in the insurance and financial services industry since 1990. Unlike medicine, which has a standardized path that physicians must take to gain the education, training, and experience requirements necessary to obtain board certification, the insurance and financial services industry does not. While he might not be a doctor's first phone call regarding their insurance needs, he is often their last. Find Larry at drpodcastnetwork.com slash Larry Keller or at the link in the description of the show. Finally, the link to that and all the other links to studies and things we talk about in the show can be found at theparadox.com slash 120. And as always, I'd like to encourage you to send questions to me at theparadoxshow at protonmail.com. If you have any show ideas, people you think I should interview, subjects that we should address, I always appreciate emails and feedback. If you've not yet done so, be sure to leave a five-star review at your favorite podcast player. Written reviews are always the best and are greatly appreciated. Again, for those who support the show financially at patreon.com slash the paradox, thank you so much for supporting the show and allowing it to be free for everyone else. And for those who cannot financially support the show, every dollar you contribute goes to the production and promotion of the show. And again, is tremendously appreciated. And especially for those of you who share the show with your friends, family, and colleagues, continue doing so. If you like what you're listening to, make sure other people get the message and hear the show. But without further ado, Dr. Sarah Lowe's and Mistrust in Medicine After Colonial Conquest. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Larson here with my new friend, Sarah Lowe's. Dr. Lowe's is an assistant professor of economics at UCSD, beautiful San Diego, graduate from Harvard University in May of 2017 with a PhD from the Power Political Economy and Government Program on an economics track, previously a postdoc fellow at the Stanford King Center on Global Development, an assistant professor of economics at Bocconi University in Italy, She's a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a CIFSAR Azrieli Global Scholar with the Institutions, Organization, and Growth Research Program, and affiliate of the Center for Economic Policy Research, and since center is spelled RE, I assume it's British. Her research interests are at the intersection of development economics, political economy, and economic history. Many of her ongoing projects are in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so, Dr. Rose, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Eric. Well, I was super interested in talking about Africa and especially with development and with the paper that you wrote, which is on um, the legacy of colonial medicine and sort of issues of trust with, uh, within the healthcare system in Africa. But before we talk about that, 
briefly to explain to me how you ended up doing all this research on Central Africa. I mean, I assume you must have taken a trip there or maybe Peace Corps um, or something like that. What's the story? Yeah. So after I graduated from college, I wanted to have some experience in the development sector. I spent some time in Vietnam and then happened to get a position in Uganda. So I spent about a year and a half living in Kampala and then northern Uganda and I just kind of got hooked and um, always had wanted to work in Congo and Central Africa and some opportunities arose during grad school. So that's how it started. And so do you, I mean, do you learn the language there as well? Are you able to, to speak many of the dialects? Um, no, I haven't learned any of the local dialects like Lingala or Chaluba uh, for Congo, at least. Yeah. yeah. So I would think there, there's not much, I mean, they're not Latin based, obviously. So it'd be very, probably pretty hard to, to learn, especially if uh, you're, when you're older, <laughs> right? Like we are. <laughs> like many things, it's harder when you're older. Um, <laughs> Harvard actually has a really great sort of Bantu uh, African language program. So they actually, I did take some Chaluba and Swahili classes while at Harvard, <laughs> just not all of it stuck. Well, I don't know really much about Congo, except that it's in Central Africa, and that when you play the game of Risk, it's almost impossible to hold Congo. And I don't know if you play Risk. Um, so why don't you talk about your paper? Because I found it really interesting, and I'd just like you to go back into, I guess, what do you mean when you talk about the legacy of colonial medicine and sort of issues of trust with Africa? Yeah, okay. Um, so the project is trying to understand um, the effects of historical medical campaigns undertaken by the French military during the colonial era. So this is basically between the 1920s and the 1950s in former French Equatorial Africa. So that would be uh, Chad, Cameroon, uh, Central African Republic, Gabon, and the Republic of Congo. So those are the present day countries that we're interested in. And basically the French military undertook these campaigns to prevent the spread of sleeping sickness which is a lethal disease spread by the tsetse fly. This tsetse fly, so the vector for the disease is only present in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so as part of these campaigns, they basically went around and forcibly inject millions of people over the course of 30 years with medications that are either intended to prevent the spread of sleeping sickness or to treat sleeping sickness. Um, and so what we're interested in doing in the paper is trying to understand how historical exposure to these campaigns affects present day trust in medicine, um, which we measure through vaccination rates for children, and a revealed preference measure of trust, so basically willingness to consent to a free and non-invasive blood test for HIV or anemia. So that's what we're, we're trying to do in the paper. Yeah. Right. And so so essentially, you're, you're looking at people, certain parts of these countries, not every part, I assume, otherwise you would have any com controls, right? And you right. compare. So yeah. certain parts of the country were exposed to European powers, and in this case, it's the France. And vaccinations, I guess, really began in earnest or treatment treatments began in the 1900s, right? I mean, what, they didn't really exist in the 1800s. And so right. as a way, I suppose, of protecting their own citizens who were doing business in in this part of Africa or as experimentation, right? The, these colonial powers were kind of experimenting on people yes. forcibly in many, in many cases, I assume, right? Right. So there wasn't consent really involved in this process. So they were often done at gunpoint. Um, so it was required to sort of be subjected to these medical examinations and to receive the injections that they were administering. Um, they had lots of different motivations for it. I do think there was some sort of genuine idea of like public health and greater good and that if they were able to inoculate everyone against sleeping sickness, that would be better for everyone. Uh, but they also weren't necessarily particularly concerned with sort of the individual effects. So some people would become blind as a result of these medications, people died. Um, and they weren't really internalizing those costs uh, to the entire program. Wow, I can't believe they actually use gunpoint and stuff for the <laughs> for yeah. administering these. And and we're talking about actually a lot of these treatments. I imagine were for children, right? And so, not only, I mean, not that it makes it worse, but it seems like it's it's harsher that you'd that you'd vaccinate or you know treat young children oh. against the parents' will, right? I'm not actually sure that these um, that the treat. I don't actually know that they administer treatments to children. I haven't actually seen what the age range was for the oh, okay. for the sleeping sickness campaigns. I guess I assumed it was primarily adults because I had just assumed that, but it's probably worth clarifying. <laughs> well, I yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know, obviously, what was going on then. And so, like, right now, the World Health Organization, all kinds of international agencies are always trying to promote health and to try and help people, like, you know, people with HIV and to identify people who have these diseases. Mm-hmm. Malaria, um, polio, all these things. And so there are vaccinations and campaigns that you have. And so my understanding is that you basically said, well, what's the likelihood of someone's going to allow their children or themselves to have a vaccine? And is that reflected on previous 
experiences within the local community, right? Yeah, that's basically it. So basically trying to link that, you know, your community or your sort of region has been exposed to these medical campaigns. How does that, even though you directly weren't affected, because this is basically several generations later, right. can we detect some sort of different systematic behavior in these sort of people in these areas? So in short, we find that they're less likely to have their children vaccinated and they're less likely to, to consent to these free blood tests. And so as economists, we sort of would consider that puzzling because we consider vaccinations to be effective. We consider you know, the information in these blood tests to be useful and also free and sort of the person's right there giving it to you. And so trying to understand why that might be the case. And so linking that to sort of trust and willingness to engage in the health sector. Do you, did you find that uh, when it comes to the, these issues of trust that it extended beyond vaccinations or is that just the one that's easiest to sort of measure? Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, basically we also match our data to other survey data. And so there's um, data from the World Value Survey Afrobarometer. They collect questions on trust in a wide variety of other people and institutions. And so we actually find that our effect that we observe is very specific to trust in medicine. So we don't find similar effects for say local leaders or for you know your neighbor or sort of a whole bunch of different other trust outcomes. How big a difference is this? Is this is this significant? Like twice as many people are more likely to get vaccinated if they haven't had a local history of uh, you know, gunpoint treatment. Yeah. So if you were to, I, so I guess one way to think about it is like if you're to move from like you know no exposure to full exposure, it's equivalent to having maybe one or two fewer vaccines of the nine possible vaccines that children can have under five that they record in our data. Um, so it's like substantive, um, particularly given that, you know, people only have five to six of these nine vaccines to begin with. Right. Um, so we're talking like 20% difference. I mean, roughly yes. something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And that's pretty, pretty big. It, how, um, how large an area are these, are we talking about? Is it just sort of like, there was a campaign in 1925 in this certain city and it wasn't in this other city that, is that how you sort of figured this out? Um, so we're covering these five different countries and within the countries, there's quite a lot of variation in exposure. So sort of our measure of exposure is the share of years over this 30 year period that you're visited. So some places are visited 25 plus times, um, other places aren't visited at all. So there's quite a lot of variation in this extent and sort of our unit of observation is going to be a, like a region or a district. Well, and this is the problem I think we have anywhere we're talking about someplace foreign. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You sort of uh, equate the entire country as being one sort of monolithic thing, mm -hmm. one place, right? It's sort of like I can talk about Nevada, and all I think about is desert, right? Or, or I might think of Mongolia, and I just think of just one thing, or China. And when it's actually incredibly diverse, I'm sure you know it's a gigantic countries. Mm -hmm. There are places that are remote. There are places that are urban, rural. I mean, I'm sure all these things really, uh, you know, on a river, not on a river. All these things probably completely mattered as far as what the penetration would be of any sort of treatment or right. campaign. Right. So it's a question, how do we deal with that sort of trying to understand how we get to causal effects or is, I mean, basically in our, in our statistical analysis, we're going to control for all those types of variables that we think might also affect willingness to get you vaccinated or sort of the extent to which you're exposed to these campaigns. Right. And so you found a general distrust in medicine for people who had a colonial exposure to, we're assuming that, that, um, that every time they had, more exposure to treatment, that it was sort of this by force or on some level, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we can't possibly say that that's the case. And there's also an interesting paradox in that, um, you know, one of the medications they use, while it had really negative side effects and would cause blindness and could kill people, it also was actually an effective treatment for the first stage of the disease if you happen to have it. So there were some like clear benefits to people who happened to be in the first stage of the disease and were identified appropriately as having the first stage of the disease. Yeah, but in terms of like whether or not we can say of, you know, that 15 visits at a particular region received, how many of them were positive in the sense that the community engaged with them. The anecdotal evidence suggests that sort of that's not the case, that, you know, it was really an unpleasant experience. In fact, there's this song from an ethnic group in central Cameroon that's basically talking about how miserable it is when the sleeping sickness campaigns come and how they, you know, force <laughs> them to take these painful injections and then make them do forced labor and how it's kind of terrible. Is there an easy way to quantify it? Like, you know, for instance, uh, you know, they have a campaign, they come through a city one time versus a place where they came through every you know, every five years for 30 years, were you able to sort of parse out 
that there may be a greater effect from, you know, one versus the other? Um, well, yeah, so that that's going to be the case, sort of the greater your exposure, the greater the effect size is okay. going to be. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so then you wrote another paper which <laughs> is about, yeah, I mean, you could academic, right? So traditional medicine and how it, its effects on um, modern medicine, I guess, and we'll say modern medicine is just vaccinations and sort of we consider <laughs> Western medicine, I guess, or whatever, but... And I guess briefly explain what traditional medicine would be to someone from the United States, right? Uh, looking at Congo or Cameroon and then what and how you think that actually affects the um, attitude towards Western medicine and how it may influence its acceptance. Okay. Yeah. So um, when we're sort of exploring the effect or sort of when people use traditional medicine, what we have in mind here are going to be sort of traditional practitioners that are usually sort of embedded in their local communities. They probably don't have formal medical training or any sort of formal licensing. They may have learned their skills from other sort of elders within the communities. Um, sometimes it's passed down within families, sort of this particular position and the knowledge that people accumulate. Um, and sort of interestingly for sort of large parts of really rural, rural and poor Africa, sort of this is the first line of healthcare access actually, sure. even though it's not part of like, formally integrated into the, in, like, the national health systems. Um, and so in this other paper, we're mostly just sort of curious about what the correlates are of the use of traditional medicine. So when are people using it? Who's most likely to use it? Um, and then, and the reason we sort of started thinking about this was as a result of our paper, the first paper where we find that people sort of mistrust modern medicine. Then the next question is obviously, so what do you do to rebuild trust? And so this was sort of trying to explore, maybe there's some role for traditional practice practitioners who may already sort of have the trust of community members to sort of get on board and help sort of bridge that gap. Um, so would that be, so was your thought that you have to get the traditional healers who I'm assuming they just use local plants and herbs and things like to treat, to treat uh, maladies mm -hmm. uh, to say, okay, you've, you've, you're gone beyond my knowledge or whatever. And now we're going to have to, I'd recommend you go to the hospital or something like that. Is that sort of, the but actually, you, you... yeah, it's kind of the model that happens. So like, I think I'd, so I've done a lot of focus groups with these traditional practitioners and my sense is they have actually a pretty well-developed niche of what kind of things they can treat. But if they, you know, if a kid comes to them who clearly has malaria and they know that the health center is over there and they can send the kid to get quartum, then they're going to do that. Um, so they seem to have a sense often of what sort of is within sort of the realm of their treatable things, or also when they know that the medical care would be prohibitively expensive. So if someone were to break a leg or something, they may not be able to afford sort of the care they would need in um, sort of a facility that we'd be more familiar with. And so they might also get treatment from, um, from the traditional practitioner. What is the what is the government's role? I mean, I imagine it might be different for the different countries, but what is the government's interplay between modern medicine, traditional medicine, and trying to restore trust in areas that they're having, they have people who are less likely to get treatments that would, they think would be help population wide. So yeah, that's an interesting question, and I'm not so the sort of um, the research I've done on traditional medicine, uh, at least in terms of focus groups and stuff, has primarily been in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Though so the paper that you were referring to is on former French Equatorial African countries. Um, and I'm actually not sure what the current policies are um, about sort of how you interface with traditional practitioners, but it's just sort of seems like, um, you know, you have this group of people who at least have some interest in, you know, medicine and service elements and, um, and also are integrated into their community. So it seems like some entryway that could possibly be effective. Sure. Do the countries though uh, have trouble with vaccination I mean, I assume a lot of these vaccination efforts are led by the by the countries themselves, mm -hmm. not necessarily NGOs. Although I'm sure they play a part of it as well. But yeah, what what are they doing to try and overcome the the obstacles of people having being distrustful, and, and are they effective, or you know which ones work? Um, so I'm also not familiar with the current sort of format of vaccination campaigns. Okay. I mean, we started. The part of our interest initially in the project came from sort of reading news articles where, you, you know, people were mistrustful of vaccination campaigns that had to be canceled or sort of with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, basically people being scared of sort of 
international health workers um, to the point of like, you know, rejecting them from their community. So sort of this type of anecdotal evidence was what got us interested in, in trying to understand this. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, I, I talk to lots of physicians who go and do me medical mission work, mm -hmm. whether sometimes Africa, where, I mean, all over the world, basically, uh, except the United States. <laughs> Well, they could probably find places here too. So. Right. Well, they could, but they're not allowed to, which is kind of the funny thing, right? Because oh. of licensing reasons, you can't actually do mission work oftentimes. I know there are lots of things that, that people do for um, relief efforts in Africa. Let's just focus on Africa because you're familiar with it. But uh, where they found that actually oftentimes by performing some service or providing s some product or, you know, food or whatever it might be, that it turns out that actually is, it hurts the infrastructure, and hurts entrepreneurs who are on the ground trying to provide that service to their, to their community. And that sometimes, you know, best of intentions, whatever, they actually are detrimental. And so I imagine that happens in medicine as well. I don't know if you're familiar with that sort of aspect too, or sort of anecdotally when you've been around in so Africa. I, yeah, the way I, I think about it is you might have this crowding out effect sort of you have sort of private provision or NGO provision of goods that otherwise might be publicly provided. And then the question is sort of how does that affect government provision of these various services? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good research. It's a good research question um, that I don't know the answer to. And I think the other concern might be that also citizens start to demand things of rather holding the government accountable for what they should be doing. They start to just think like, well, these private actors can be doing it instead. So you even right. get potentially less accountability. Uh, I always, you know, I've always been asked to, to go on mission work and I have a number of partners who do anesthesia in other countries. And, um, and I never, I never know how I feel about it. I mean, I, there's absolutely the, the urge to help people. And mm -hmm. um, aside from not wanting to be way, it's just inconvenient with the family and stuff to, to try and actually do those sorts of things. But I'm always, I'm always torn because I feel like, uh, you know, if you provide something for free, if there's someone who's actually charging or who's made it their profession, now you've, like you said, that you're crowding them out and they're, you're not making it available. Uh, and so I, I always wonder what the best route to try and provide those services because you, you, um, you know, it's like the biblical thing, right? You want to, it's better to feed, teach someone how to fish than to give them a fish, right? And so there's some balance there, right, of providing the service, but also helping, I suppose, locally people to figure out how to do things at least for the case of you know basic health care my feeling is that people are suffering quite a lot in many of these countries they have access to very few sort of health resources and that any sort of help that you know a qualified medical professional could provide would probably be deeply valued that's okay. my personal perspective is that you know a lot of what people suffer from are super treatable things yeah and they right. just don't have access to what they would need to to have them treated so right i mean i i recall you know after the the uh, hurricane hit haiti badly i there are a lot of people here who went down to haiti to provide you know orthopedic trauma care and things like that mm -hmm. which there just weren't enough people to do that sort of thing in haiti N nor do they have the infrastructure um and anyway i one other thing that i noticed people talk about is um when they go on these missions that you oftentimes have to be embedded for quite a while so you go every year for 10, 15 years, and then people sort of start trusting you. So there, the mistrust in modern medicine or people showing up, there must be a decent legacy of people having mistrust or been mistreated by people who just come in saying, oh, I'm going to come and do surgeries for you. And it turns out they are just like practicing or they've never done it before or mm -hmm. they're so bad they can't get a job where they're from, whatever country. And so they go to sure. you know, Africa because they can now I can operate. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, God, that's terrible. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I agree with you sort of the longer you're working in a place, the more certain, like the more e easily you're going to sort of build trust with people and have better relationships. Um, and particularly for things like medical care, I'd imagine that's like very important. What are your future research products when it comes to medicine? Well, I mean, we're in the midst of a pandemic. I recognize <laughs> it. it's difficult to do any sort of research It is difficult uh, in, in Africa, but uh I'm sure you're you're waiting to get itching to get back on a plane and get over there. Yeah. So what what's your plan for for research further in the Central Africa? Um, so 
Um, right now I have a couple of ongoing projects in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I, hopefully this summer um, I'll be able to, you know, be fully vaccinated and maybe get to go to Congo. Though it's pretty unclear at the moment sort of what sort of restrictions I guess there'll be. Um, so my ongoing work is actually looking at sort of um, traditional supernatural beliefs. So basically uh, belief in witchcraft and how belief in witchcraft affects pro-social behavior. Um, so that's obviously not related to medicine, um, but um, I'm also hoping to work on a project on trying to understand sort of what the role of traditional practitioners can be in improving provision of, of health services. But that's sort of a, a longer term sort of project that isn't going anywhere at the moment, given that I'm in San Diego. <laughs> do you actually, do you actually um, sort of do experiments or you just do mainly research and survey work I mean, do, um, do you so, want to set it, what's your plan, I guess, for the traditional medicine? So um, for the traditional medicine project, that would probably would end up being a randomized control trial. But before that, you know, it would be a lot of sort of um, interviews with people, survey work, trying to document some patterns on like what services people are actually providing when they go to the modern health sector, when they go to the traditional health sector. Uh, things like that before you could get anywhere close to being able to do like an actual RCT. So, <laughs> and I guess the final question, sort of getting back to the original uh, topic about mistrust in modern medicine because of colonial influence earlier, what do you think the, um, how do you think it's passed down? Why do you think that sort of mistrust exists? It, when mm -hmm. you're talking to these people, I mean, you must have some sort of feel for why they felt this way because that led you to do research on. I may mean, imagine there's some sort of thing about about it that sparked your curiosity. What was your what was your feel for that? Yeah, so I mean, from a sort of more academic perspective, you know, people can sort of learn mistrust mistrusting behaviors from their parents without even knowing sort of what the original sort of impetus or from their community without even knowing what the original impetus for that mistrust is. And so while there is anecdotal evidence that people can sort of point back to these campaigns and the experiences that happen during these campaigns. And if you were to talk to an average person, I don't think that would be part of the narrative that they're telling, but they still may have sort of learned particular sort of like, oh, you shouldn't go do this or like be wary when like people ask to like jab you with the vaccination or whatever. <laughs> um, and so I actually think it can be pretty subtle. It's just like learned, beha learned behaviors from your family or community that sort of keep you from engaging um, in the health sector. Does it be sort of be part of a religion or um, just part of like the culture? I mean, the sort of mistrust, because I feel like you hear that oftentimes with like, I want to say Somalis who've uh, immigrated into the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. I did a lot of mm -hmm. Somalians there. And so part of their religion, or at least within religion's religious community is this distrust of vaccinations, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, is that sort of, do you think it just becomes like a cultural thing or, yeah. uh, or is it So I w I'm not necessarily a religious thing, but sort of, I, I would think of trust as sort of an aspect of culture that it's like learned, uh, it affects your behavior. Um, it helps you determine sort of what things you should be doing. Like, do you interact with strangers? Yes or no. Do you take the medication? <laughs> yes or no. So yeah, I think it's exactly what it is. It's a part of your culture, basically. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Lewis, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, where's a good place for people to get a hold of you or find out more about what you're working on or writing and oh, et cetera? Okay. Yeah. I have a website. Um, <laughs> it's sarahlowes.com. Um, pretty easy to find, I think. There's also a singer called Sarah Lowe's, but that's not me. <laughs> so <laughs> if you see someone singing, that's definitely not me. <laughs> definitely not you. And it's Sarah without an H, right? That's uh, uh, no H, an important distinction. Yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, I saw you're on Twitter and LinkedIn and all the usual, all the usual social media places. These yeah. days. Yep. <laughs> well, thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much, Eric. It was really fun. Thanks again to my guest, Dr. Sarah Lowe's. And before we end, don't forget to reach out to Larry Keller of Physician Financial Services for your disability insurance needs. He's been around for a while in many physician communities helping them with the coverage they need. Find Larry at drpodcastnetwork.com slash Larry Keller. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. 
Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. Ha 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 ha